Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 467. It should be episode number 467. If it's not episode number 467, then I do apologize, but it definitely is episode number 46, Blood 7. And I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing splendid. I really, really do. How am I? You know, all things good on my end. I cannot complain. Things could be better. But hey, we take what we can. We take what we can. I have been, you know, spending way too much time checking the news, reading up on what's been going on with these balloons, these spy balloons that have been traversing all across parts of North America and trying to figure out with my sleuth, um, you know, autodidact mind, why exactly these things exist and what they're doing. Are they specifically trying to gather some information from the North Americans out there? Are they, you know, sending those balloons out there in an effort to get North American, you know, military to respond with particular fighter jets that not a lot of the public know anything about to see what their weaponry actually does? Is it all just a provocation for provoca provocation's sake who actually knows but the whole kerfuffle around it being labeled you know ufos and non-ufos and unidentified objects and you know flying things and people not wanting to state what they are and cylindrical objects has been really fascinating to see because what you do end up seeing now regardless of the evidence has been leaked i think you know we got some evidence beforehand um, I think through the FBI, was it through the FBI or something? I forgot who it was, but we had some information coming out, maybe from the Pentagon, if I'm not mistaken, um, essentially explaining and giving away the details that there have been sightings of identified flying objects, so clear UFOs in the past. So there is some acknowledgement of it from the government over there. So as much as we know that, it is quite refreshing to see people not running to the idea that there are ancient aliens or, you know, aliens from you know, way, way, way in the future than us here, kind of traversing and kind of, you know, observing us. I'm, I like that most people just don't buy into the alien narrative and they're, you know, trying to rationally and logically explain it away. That is a good thing. That means collectively our conscious has been somewhat risen. You know what I mean? Like we're some we're somehow locked in, but we're not that dumb. You know, we try to, we kind of enjoy the dumbness that we talk about on social, but we're not going to really run with it that far. So I like that people aren't really running with the alien things, but I would actually like it if it was an alien thing, to be completely fair. That would be quite refreshing and obviously distracts us from the horrors that are going on right now with what's happening in Turkey and Syria. Um, obviously, what's the ongoing situation that's happening in Ukraine. Um, the constant, constant protests and violence has been happening in parts of France. Like, you know, the world's on fire. Of course, you had that thing happening already with the with the train blowing up in Ohio. You had a shooting on a campus in Michigan. So all these crazy things are blowing up all over the place. So I would actually welcome an alien invasion of some you know aspect i think that would be quite good for us it would kind of band us around together to kind of fight <laughs> and to battle and to fight for love and family and all this sort of nonsense like that would actually bring us more together i swear to god one thing also i wanted to mention quickly on this pod that really annoys me and i think i do it a lot when i'm talking especially on a video because i got a monitor here where i can see myself these flipping nose piercings I got, one of my biggest regrets in life, and I don't have many, because I like to just, you know, put one foot in front of the other and just keep on moving. One of the biggest regrets I have in life when I got my nose piercings done is I didn't do both at the same time, or that I wasn't very picky about the second one that I ended up getting, because the fact that they're off in terms of their placement, it just doesn't sit right with me, and I'm always noticing it, and I think when my balls or the little piercing balls I have in my nose are small, it's not as, you know, you can't see it as much, but when I have things that are just this big, which are, I don't know, I think they're like five millimeters or something. I got some, you know, some bigger ones the other day from the shop. You can definitely tell that the one over here, so this one there on the right hand side actually of my nose is the one that I got new. So that's the one that's been done recently and it's just all over the place. It should be a little bit more in the center, you know, because I do, I, do I do prefer how they pierced it the first time on the left hand side where they brought it a little bit closer to the front of my nose as opposed to the back and I can clearly see it. Now, can this be fixed? I'm not too sure because I'd imagine if you do pierce it, if you do make another hole, it'd probably have to go through the same hole. I don't know what that does to your skin overall, who knows? 
because their nose piercings take a while to get healed up and it's annoying and it's sore and stuff and you forget how much you touch your nose and your face when you're washing and all that stuff and it can be a little bit irritating but I'm gonna have to get it fixed because it's driving me mental like I can't stop looking at the fact that this one on this side is completely you know off like it should be a little bit more over here like towards the front of my nose a little bit more but you know what can you do the last thing you want to do is start like being nitty picky with somebody in the barber you know, sorry in, in the in the piercing shop i already know how it doesn't work when you go to a barber so piercing shops will be probably worse um talking about barbers talking about barbers there's this really funny clip that's gone kind of viral online on my side of social media regarding former England and Manchester City player Michael Richards essentially detailing how much he spends on like male grooming and upkeep in terms of getting his hair cut done and obviously getting his beard trimmed and I mentioned it a few times here on the pod my eternal and long-lasting struggle and beef with black barbers here in the UK it has been long documented I said plenty of times that the one place I did go to called just for F for fade or just for fade one and then one or the other it's got fade in the name and it was in Stanmore which is the complete opposite side of London where I'm from it's like an hour and a half in the train directly there and it's like 27 stops or something and I used to go there every single day one hour back one hour there one hour back um, to get my haircuts and pay like you know 30 to 50 pounds for them but they were legitimately one of the best haircuts I've ever got in my life and the closest thing I've ever got to achieving the kind of you know American Odell Beckham s kind of look of a fade because if you've if you really care about your haircuts and you're black or you like to go to black barbers it doesn't matter if you're not black you know I've seen a lot of you know whites and Asians and you know Turkish lads in there and stuff whatnot and obviously you Somalis love them also but you know what I mean but if you're familiar with black barbers and you would know that the pierce of resistance the real top 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 grade is definitely American barbers they just have a way of finishing the fade that just makes it look very well done i don't know how to describe it even the the, the, the even the gradient from like the bottom of your hair all the way to the top looks a bit better obviously the lines and and the edges look really nice and then how they kind of fill in their hair sometimes with the black paint ink stuff to fill in some gaps or it just you know moisturize it whatever they do they do something that really kind of makes the fades pop and i've realized that they do it on all things it could just be skin fades it could be taper fades whatever they just got a great to do it. even like shape ups they do really well so that standard for some reason i'm not too sure what the reason is but for some reason in the uk it doesn't exist um a lot of it is just like you know the the bare minimum type of haircuts like you know they make sure that you look clean but there's no real attention to detail to kind of get in the finish really top notch so some places depending on where you live you could be paying 30 pound 40 pound 50 pound for a haircut and it has nothing to do with the quality it just has to do with the convenience so they could be like one of the only few barbers decent ones in your area and no one wants to be traveling an hour plus like i was because i stopped going there myself even everyone just wants convenience to be able to go out and just quickly go get it so no one wants to go travel so then the barbers kind of you know have the monopoly on that regard so they don't really need to push themselves to be better because people are gonna turn up regardless if the haircuts are four out of ten no one's gonna really care as long as they're not crap crap people are gonna go but obviously in the last few years things have kind of changed and increased obviously with stuff like social media i feel like access or people seeing what good haircuts look like has essentially pushed barbers to do more because now people are expecting more from their barbers if they're going to pay upwards of like 30 pounds and 50 to 100 of your celebrity but michael richards here detailed in this clip that he pays anywhere close to 200 pounds every time he gets a haircut and he gets a haircut three times a week now for michael richards is different because he's a tv presenter and i think you know that once you see yourself on tv with a sick trim i'd imagine it's very difficult to go back on tv without a good trim i think it's one thing if you don't have one but to see yourself dusty on tv just what you know after you have had a trim you're just not going to look good you're going to feel like you know you're going to feel horrible about yourself and you're not going to want to repeat it so i'm sure that's kind of plays into it as well or he just might be one of those dudes because i knew a few guys this even back when we were in school who'd get their haircuts like once a week and i was always like surprised like jesus where do you get the money from because even back then you know haircuts were like 10 pounds 20 pound and you know at that age when you don't have any money at all and you're under 16 you're thinking how the hell do you even have 20 pounds to spend on a haircut let alone 20 pound overall so it's mad but yeah mike richards is here explaining how he gets 200 pound haircuts every single three weeks and the problem here is that the haircuts don't even look that great in my opinion micah flew his own barber out to qatar of what course what did? i've got to look fly what did you just say three times a week you flew your own what, what, is, what does that cost you on the what real? What does that cost you? What, what, is it, what does my barber cost? Like, what does it cost you to get your hair cut? £200. Free? What? 
I like I like people do that when they don't want to answer a question or they feel uncomfortable or they they haven't really kind of rationalized themselves in their head. Like, how much did it cost? How much did it cost me? You repeat it back again. Two hundred pounds for that haircut. Now, get me wrong. The one thing I do like about it is the line's really good, but a lot of that is to do with makeup. I'd imagine. When you're going on a show on TV, usually um, they'll give you a little spruce up and they'll kind of make sure your edges and your kind of face, you know, the actual outline of your face is always presentable on, like, on TV. So if you just got a fresh trim, the, the the makeup part, especially if it's somebody that's black or knows has to do black hair, they could probably just be able to guide along the lines and conceal some bits here and there and actually clean up your face so you actually look a lot more sharper than you didn't come out of the chair, which they do in photoshops. So I photoshops a lot in barbershops where they'll, they'll take a picture of somebody, but, you know, it's been it's been cleaned up on Photoshop. There's loads of makeup on the edges to make it look super sharp. So that's probably adding to how it looks. But in terms of a fade, from what I can see from this picture on this Instagram, it's not that impressive from what I can see personally. But still, it goes to show you the levels because he's Mike Richards definitely got access to better barbers than I do, and he's paying him two hundred pound. And obviously, they're going to him as well. So that's another thing, which is obviously the convenience of it is awesome. But he's paying 200 pounds per haircut and it's still not great so this definitely goes to back up my point that the standards over in london are shit because i recognize my 30 pound my 50 pound doesn't go too far and for sure it doesn't go far far that far either with him paying 200 pound in my opinion a time yes so you're spending 600 pounds a week well on your when hair. i say the most is for, so if i'm working like i'll get a trim tomorrow for champions league and I'm working weekend, so I'll get a trim. So, so we did it today. We did it today. <laughs> and he'll do it tomorrow. Yeah, I've got to get a sharp. So I've got to get a sharp for tomorrow. Week. <laughs> so hang on, two, two, hair hair ca- two haircuts in two days. Yeah. Mm. What? Messi hasn't even got a goal ratio like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to give him four hundred quid tomorrow? Yes. Are you paying that or CBS? No, I have to pay it. Oh, okay. Mm. To be fair, I should be putting it through expenses, shouldn't I? Yeah. yeah. Like, what's the purpose? And what's why? I've what's got he to gonna look, do I've to got that? to look sharp. I've got to look. You know what I mean? The lineup is, is that, is is that more in your head? Something that you have in your head no, that you, you need know, to. You, you know, when you look good, you get. You get... Micah flew is. So yeah, I don't know. I feel him. I know the pain. I know what he's going through because haircuts in London are just, or in the UK, are just terrible. But to say this is a two hundred pound trim is just not the vibe. But still, it's better than most. You know, I can't. I can't remember the last time I've had a, a lineup this sharp in any way I've gone to in the hood. So clearly, you know, if you've got the money to do it, then why not? If there's one thing I've kind of learned, especially the older I've become in life, is like, especially if you're earning some, you know, some decent amount of money you should enjoy and indulge yourself in the kind of self-care things that actually do bring you some level of joy and there's no denying once you step out of that flipping barber chair after you've got a little sp- alcohol spray done and striped all over your edges and stuff and you take a look at yourself in the mirror you lick your lips like your LL Cool J that feeling is indescribable there's no amount of money you can put on it that would not make that feeling not go away every single time you get out of a chair even at my big age so I definitely understand why he's doing it sometimes I was just that dopamine hit you know what i mean that feeling of stepping out thinking rah they're not ready they don't even know what time i'm on they don't know what power i have and he's obviously getting that the hit three times a day three times a week sorry he's getting that hit boom 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 but three times you know get a haircut back to back every other day is a little bit excessive but hey if you've got the funds why not and if it makes you feel good why the hell not in my opinion why the hell not then I want to quickly mention this as well because I think this is quite funny because it made me think about um, some dudes. There are a lot of them out there. The kind of you know the guys that are like, oh, I would never let my girl do OnlyFans kind of person. You know, they're my property and da, 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 that kind of weird thinking of guys. And there's you know maybe they're they're like Andrew Tate acolytes. But a lot of it is, I think, centered around some level of insecurity in some respects, especially when you try to control somebody's um, free will and expression and stuff. It just doesn't really focus or rattle in my head, especially in the modern age as well. I think back in the day, maybe there's more you know, instinct to do those kind of things because societally, the pressures on women put them in a corner so that you can kind of add to that pressure by making them do certain things but i think nowadays considering how free and liberal things are considering how open especially in the you know in the western world that we are now it just seems like a really unnecessary headache you're giving yourself by trying to convince somebody that the thing that they want to do isn't right because you're not comfortable with it and then trying to make some moralistic principled religious reasoning behind it also just doesn't sit right with me so all that to say 
I saw this post again, another one on the show, the show Barra, featuring some guy called David Whiteley, who I'm not really too sure who he is. Uh, at first, I thought it was this guy. I forgot who his name is. Who he does all loads of talking on flipping um, podcasts and stuff. But I thought the screenshot was rather funny. He says the following, Mandem that might know a decent amount of rappers in person. Is it weird when your girl listens to them? LOL. So this person is asking his per- their followers on social media. Is it? Am I the only person that feels weird or uncomfortable when my girlfriend likes a rapper that I know in person, like as a musician? And I'm thinking to myself, and obviously the picture there features. I think it's like I think that's Jay Huss, um, Stormzy, and and Dave right in the picture that's on the f- on the screen. And it's it's it, it's just it's such a nonsense question to throw out there, but it's obviously drenched in insecurity in that somehow the fact that your girlfriend is interested or likes a certain male rapper is somehow kind of taken away from whatever relationship or you know whatever thing situation you have going on with that woman like somehow listening to somebody rapping on a track is equivalent to them finger banging your missus in the back of a cinema or something or you know lipsing her down or digging her guts in or something it's like are you insane are you literally insane that that is something that you would be kind of weirded out by or grossed out by it's just really really bizarre and i think there is a just a category of dude that exists out there like just neeks dorks and just kind of waste guys whatever in general who just you know maybe it's the internet made them comfortable maybe it's just life in general or maybe it's just you know this accept or just maybe not accept maybe just kind of like embracing of being kind of other and alternative and having kind of a way to look at things or whatnot or maybe it's just a lack of real shame and scrutiny and standards and whatever it may be in in manhood in general that kind of forces this sort of stuff but you'd imagine these sort of um reflections or insights will be stuff you keep to yourself like you wouldn't want to let anybody know that you actually felt this kind of uncomfortable like i know with me there was an era i grew up in an era where even if you did feel insecure about certain things you'd pretend that you didn't just so you didn't come across super emotional just so you didn't come across moist you wouldn't want anyone to know that you feel that way even if you did feel that way and you'd along the way convince yourself if you didn't feel that way so that you could carry on acting a certain way which is obviously you know maybe not the best thing to do and maybe not the best thing for your mental health overall but what it does do is that it kind of reduces the probability of you looking like an absolute wild on the internet and i think i'd much rather you know avoid that than have a story or tweet go viral that people are fans of and they're clicking because i think that damaged reputation of how people look at you it never goes away like for instance this guy they've got pictures on the screen i wish i remembered his name he kind of you know was got he kind of got a lot of stick on uk side of black twitter and stuff because he basically came across like somebody who clearly was struggling to assert himself in the area that he was in and maybe was uncomfortable with the fact that he wasn't regarded as an alpha male i think he had a Back, back back and forth with some other person who basically you know admitted to him in the face i think it was a woman actually said hey i don't think you're an alpha male and obviously that kind of cut a bit deep in his self-confidence and since then he has been able to live that little interaction down kind of similar to the dj academics like you know fiddling around with the microphone when amigos got up when he was confronting joe budden there are certain things those things do to your manhood and to your pride and your ego that no amount of conversation can ever kind of correct but i think similar to the DJ academic thing i think in life sometimes if you are getting kind of mutted and you are kind of getting sunned online and people are looking at you like with a side eye and thinking you're a bit of a neek you probably need to get a lick back and you need to get it back very publicly and very loudly you have to do it you have to rewrite the narrative in some way shape or form but i think nowadays people just don't mind as long as people are talking about them, like myself included, right? I'm just a nobody out here and stuff, but I'm speaking about this sort of stuff. So clearly it does work in terms of getting your name out there. And sometimes if you really have nothing else going for you, but you have people talking about you online, that can feel like a win. So I can definitely understand why it's kind of gone this way, but I just wish there was a time. I just wish we lived in a time where guys cared about being cool. Like that was an actual thing. Like you cared about being cool. You cared about being well regarded. You cared about being well thought of. Now people go out of their way to like <laughs> demonstrate how much pieces of crap they are, or like you know how moist they are and stuff, and you know be you know laying bare all their emotions and talking about and overly, overly in my opinion because it, you know, it does exist some issues with mental health. But I think some people do overly talk about it because they just really don't have anything else to talk about, or there's nothing else interesting about them as people that would warrant a conversation. So let's just talk about mental health 
everything past traumas because everyone can connect with it. It's all like the common lowest form denominator of fucking connectivity and whatever else that exists out there, in my opinion. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? So also, I went to mention the other day, I was actually in um, Coco's, right, the other day, as I mentioned prior, because I went to go see Dixon, my man Dixon play, Coco, Dixon, Coco, Dixon. And as you guys have known, I've been speaking about it often, talking about how they did a big refurb over there, and they spent like, I think, 70 million or something to get it all spruced up and stuff, according to this article here from the Evening Standard. And I have to be honest, having spent some time in there, I don't know where that money went. And I'm starting to question whether or not all these refurbishments, these flipping upgrades that they do to these places and the money they, they, they raise for them and whatnot and spend for it, if this is not all some sort of big scam and where the money ends up allegedly, supposedly, this is rumours I'm talking about, it's not based on any kind of fact, but I wonder if this money just ends up in people's back pockets or goes to pay for, you know, lavish flipping end of year celebrations or whatever else it may be because i didn't see any of this 70 million that they spent on the flipping unveiling or launching of flipping coco in the slightest so i want to quickly check over this article and see where that money went to so this is the following um it's been a tough challenge in two years at the ceo ollie bango so on to be the last stretch and looking forward to launching next spring is obviously a great moment for my team and everyone at coco we're now just really excited to bring back coco back some 70 million has been pumped into the redevelopment which has enabled four story upwards extension of the great two listed theater as well as expansion into two adjacent buildings a former piano factory dating back to 1800s and the old hope and archer pub which counted as charles dickinson's um, among its local patrons so essentially they raised it up a few levels they added a rooftop bar they extended it in the width and it cost 70 million as a revamp it's no wonder when i was in there actually in there to see dixon play i know there's absolutely no difference to the times i've been there prior to see jenny aiko to see best coast and maybe some other people along the time it didn't seem that much different to me overly legit it didn't seem that much different to me and i sat there wondering to myself hmm i wonder if some of this money goes in people's back pockets but hey it doesn't matter who cares on to the dixon stuff so dixon was playing at uh, coco's and i have to be honest number one i think i came away with the realization that i might have to give dixon a break as much as I love him and I enjoy his DJ sets and I love him as an artist and a DJ and his approaches to it and his philosophy around it and the world that he's created with inner visions and his labels and he's lost in the moments parties and the experience and how tactile he is behind the decks and his style and whatnot. All the stuff is amazing, but sonically, in terms of the music that he plays, in my opinion, it's as drab and as repetitive as like some of these Ama Piano DJs out there. And, you know, nowadays, especially Amma Piano is a good as, you know, it's kind of reached critical mass. People are becoming very rich and famous off of it very quickly. And loads of people are coming in and just kind of making the most low effort, basic bottom feeder type music in that kind of realm. And it isn't really hitting anymore. And it's all starting to sound the same. It's kind of going through the same sort of thing that happened with Afro Beats before it kind of transitioned into Afro Pop and got a little bit interesting and fresh again. It's kind of getting repetitive. And I have to be honest, the first few minutes that we spent seeing Dixon play, especially when he's warming up, because, you know, when Dixon's playing all night sets, he has this philosophy or this principle that he has, you know, about those long sets where he likes to kind of, quote unquote, reset the room. So he'll play something somewhat dreary, somewhat slow, somewhat, you know, calm and calming um, that has no reflection of what's going to happen later to kind of reset the room and kind of get it all started and slow down and relax and obviously get people to pay attention and to be in the moment blah 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 and then slowly ramp it up as he's kind of progressing through the night but unfortunately that star really did kind of affect me negatively and i immediately started to get bored immediately and it's been a long time since i go to a club and i've been bored but then i realized actually when i was in there i was realized i think to myself i think dixon might be the only dj outside of maybe dj harvey who i've seen multiple times like and I got, and maybe again, outside DJ Harvey, maybe outside the arm and stuff, but there's not many DJs who I like, who I appreciate and who I love, where I've seen them play multiple times back to back. That's okay. That's the major, sorry, I just remembered. That's the major thing. It's not that I've not seen him or not seen others a lot. It's that I see Dixon consecutively. And I think that's the main issue. And for his style of music that he plays, which you describe it as like atmospheric house, FIFA house, 
deep house, um, house just in general, it's a very particular kind of sound. And that particular kind of sound, in my opinion, just isn't that interesting after a long period of time. It just sounds a bit repetitive. So after the intro, after the first couple of hours, I was already bored and not really in the mood. But the venue itself really kind of captivates you and kind of brings you back into the moment. Weirdly enough, as distracting as it is being a theatre, it somehow keeps centering you because of how awe-inspiring it looks. And I think as a arena and as a place to host DJ sets, I think it's probably one of the best in terms of the kind of um, places that aren't necessarily quintessential nightclubs. I think they transformed it really well. I think one thing they did really well there actually to pick up the Coco once they kind of sorted it out is that obviously just imagine like a regular theatre. You Some people have got the picture of it here on the screen. But if you imagine what a regular theatre kind of looks like, usually on the stage, what they would do in these sort of arenas if they had DJs is they would normally put the decks right here at the back where the drums would be if a band was playing and for me in my opinion i always felt like that kind of creates a little bit of separation and it kind of puts dj too far back in in on the stage and you don't really feel connected in some way but whoever made the decisions to do this i think is really genius in that what they did is that they brought the deck further towards the front of the stage like the well yeah the front the edge of the stage and then what that ended up doing is that freeing up the room behind dixon and they made that room behind him and they kind of cornered it off and put a gate in front of it and made that the vip quote-unquote area so if you wanted to pay extra money and want to be in the booth kind of style you could stand behind dixon and kind of you know smell him and touch him from there but also give him the space to play and i felt like in that auditorium it kind of created a real nice link through the back of the room all the way to the front of the room like from one side to the other it kind of made us all feel like one um, and even i think if you look at some people's pictures i'm sure people who have pictures who stood to the, at the back like underneath where the sound kind of people are and lighting people are and i'm sure those pictures you can see like a wave of people going from the back of the room all the way onto the front of the stage so i think all that stuff looked really really well in that regard but like i said after you know getting all giddy about the flipping environment and the interior and how cool and amazing it looked after a while i just got bored i just got legitly bored of kind of being in there for a while and if anything i kind of lasted longer than i expected because i think i was legitimately thinking of leaving at that one but you know we're already uh, we we luckily got there really early because i'll take it for like you know before eleven thirty. so getting there really early kind of helped to kind of you know feel like you didn't waste your money and you kind of got some of your money's worth so stay there until like free i did anyway and ended up getting the uber back home because i just you know wasn't really feeling it too tough and another thing that i really liked about it is like twofold liked and didn't like is that the crowd was a lot more varied and diverse and in terms of age ranges than usual dicks and nights because this event was um promoted and kind of put out there by coco so they kind of i guess in-house team or whoever's managing their bookings did this and it wasn't something that they did in conjunction with labyrinth who usually are kind of you know running some of the innovision uk type of events and as good as labyrinth are and as great as what they've done over the last few years and stuff we've been to a few of their events and they've been really really fun from gerd jansen to dixon um, to tricks and stuff they really do a good job of kind of programming put those events together and you know for me personally i kind of got bored of that approach and that crowd a bit after a while it's a very young um the approach is you know a certain way that sometimes the, the, the venues that they choose aren't really for me and my liking the production can be a little bit improved but i felt like someone else beginning given a chance to present dixon in the uk kind of spruced up a little bit of something interesting and new and i think that's probably why it sold out and again this is one of the only events i've been to this year or i've been to in the last 18 months that felt like it was generally sold out because in nightlife in i guess it's probably the same thing in flipping mu in music just overall not just dance music but there is definitely a big problem and issue with people lying about ticket sales and kind of embellishing the truth and making it seem like something sold out when it isn't sold out but this was the only one that actually was because weeks and sometimes days before the event there was no tickets popping up on the ra resell queue every ticket that was being listed on ticket swap was being snapped up the second it was made available people were begging and pleading for tickets on facebook 
Facebook groups all over the place. Um, you know, crate diggers or whatever they call them. Those guys will probably to be able to tell you more about that whole situation. And then when we got there, you could clearly see there was a lot of demand for it. And I think I heard something about, oh, they were selling tickets at the door for like £100 to get in also. So clearly there was a big demand for this event and people were really happy with it. So it was good to see a very red, varied and diverse age group crowd. It was also good to see a lot of girls in there just from just a, a visual point of view i think it's nice in that approach and it's also interesting that dixon has that appeal you know i don't know maybe girls find him hot anyway but he's an older dude in general and he doesn't really carry himself as a party boy so to see him be able to attract such like cool you know hip hot looking girls was quite interesting to see but the other thing that was a little bit concerning was the fact that everyone was really off their face <laughs> everyone was absolutely yacked off their face and this is probably one of the only events maybe it happens a lot at gigs so i don't go to a lot of live music gigs as much as i probably should do i go to a lot of nightclubs and stuff i don't go to see a lot of bands and musicians play so this is a thing that actually does happen but this is probably one of the biggest this is probably one of the the most times I've ever seen people take bumps on the dance floor or on the on the, on the flipping you know main floor or whatever people taking bumps every single every time I looked around you see somebody crouching down and having a quick line a quick bump or something because obviously the toilets were absolutely crazy packed and busy oh the toilets looked impressive actually that's maybe that's where the 70 million went if I'm wondering where that 70 million would have to, might have went to the toilets the toilets were quite nice but they're always packed so I saw many people on the dance floor doing that and obviously that added to the added to the environment added to the atmosphere people were geeked people were hyped but you know they were a little bit too geeked and hyped for me so i had to leave and bounce and you know after a while i kind of got bored but that was pretty much decent i enjoyed going to camden i don't really go to north london too often and that was pretty decent to kind of check it out and i'm going to play here a quick clip that features dixon playing and you can see what it kind of looked like on the inside this is courtesy of coco electronic the instagram account that features all their stuff they do in terms of dj nights over there so yeah good times i enjoyed it many many good laughs i had and big up to the people that i bumped into over there that kind of said hi and whatnot that was nice of you i think one particular guy i might have named was tom tim i think or something tim or tom you know who you are if you're listening so big up you um for saying hi and stuff so that's always nice to see when you're in these public spaces and whatnot so big up everybody else in there big up everybody else in there oh yeah and of course we have to mention the hot news of the last couple of days or so has been Louis Vuitton finally announcing who's going to be their men's creative director going forward for the next couple of years or few years, I guess, a permanent one. And it's been a bit of a wild card pick, a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a pick that came out from far, far, far out wide that I wasn't really expecting or really um i would have guessed it in any way shape or form and they've announced that pharrell is going to be the next men's creative director pretty pretty amazing pretty sick pretty out there pretty unexpected considering all the names that are being floated considering the approach they're trying to do going forward considering everything that was said by lvmh the rumors the insiders blah 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 i don't think anybody really had pharrell's name on their list in terms of potential replacements for the deceased um unfortunately virgil abloh who obviously was leading the charge over there did some interesting and great things going forward so it says here because of the tweet from louis vuitton louis vuitton appoints pharrell as its new mentor creator director his first collection for louis vuitton will be revealed this june so only a few months coming um during march during men's fashion week in paris so he doesn't have men you know you know a lot of time to kind of enjoy the moment and to soak it all in and to receive all the dms and the emails and the praises and the text messages and the calls he has to kind of get to work pretty sharply to present this collection that's happening in june already so pretty wild so i would assuming he's gonna do his own collection it's not gonna be anything that was archived from prior times of virgil um you know we saw what happened with the cult with the kid super guy he kind of went in there did his own thing for a while so it's clearly something he has to turn around pretty quickly and then um, we've got more information here courtesy of Louis Vuitton so Louis Ferrell Jones Louis Vuitton as a men's creative director and will debut the collection for Louis Vuitton in June during men's fashion week in Paris that's Ferrell there pictured signing the contract it looks like like a football player sat next to a 
think the new LVMH CEO, and I think he's also the person who might be responsible for bringing Pharrell to there over there. So there's a lot of you know overlap in that regard. And another tweet here saying Louis Vuitton is likely to welcome Pharrell as new Enzo director. His first collection will be revealed next June during Men's Fashion Week in Paris. So this is pretty interesting. I think when I read it originally, it said next June. I just assumed they meant next year, so that would give him ample time to kind of get his feet under the table and learn and kind of, you know, iron out the kinks and blah, blah, blah. But they actually mean next June as in June coming up, which is pretty crazy to think for somebody that has no fashion experience. So for me, taking into consideration just the pictures overall, I think that's be a good way to kind of tell the picture. So there's a picture here of Pharrell. I don't think it's an old one. I think it's a recent one, but it could be old because the guy is always ever young. He's like the flipping black, you know, Benjamin Button. But obviously, selecting somebody like a Pharrell Williams to take over Louis Vuitton isn't necessarily done on the basis of his, you know, acumen as a designer, his fashion expertise or any way, shape or form. It's clearly something done because of his cultural relevancy and his, um, you know, and his... Um, what you call it? What would you call him? You call him a really high level tastemaker in that regard. Those things kind of contribute to. I think his contribution to music could be somewhat related to it, but I think that's completely separate in my opinion. Um, but I still think him culturally as a person would obviously lend people like Louis Vuitton to look at him and think, you know what, he could be someone to take us forward, especially when you think about what Louis Vuitton, what Louis Vuitton was like when Virgil was in charge. I think they realized that having that person leading the charge who was a cultural phenomenon kind did a lot more for the brand and its reputation how it's perceived than having somebody that's really technically astute in terms of putting together collections and designing clothes and whatnot so that makes a lot more sense right for the person for williams gets it in that regard then i look at this picture for williams sat next to the lvmh ceo and it makes me think you know what this this would this should always been the option this was always going to be the pick because it feels like a fresh pick and it feels like something that this ceo probably dreamt up himself as an idea because i feel like the names regarded or floated prior like the martin rose the Grayswell bonners the samuel rosses i think those names were names that were floated by whoever was in charge prior so whoever hired again i don't know any details i'm just kind of guessing off the seat of my pants here because i think that's way more fun than flipping going in and fucking finding information so just bear with me and i'm talking about this kind of come from my point of view as ill-informed as you may think it is just bear with me i have a feeling that whoever signed virgil abloh or to louis vuitton at the time to make him into a director is not the same person who is now in charge and that person which obviously would make sense because it's a new ceo I'd, I'd assume if that's the case then like any big corporation when it comes to the creative directors and ceos and stuff because i know it happened to me when i was at working at nike I was working at Nike for a while, this really cool Nike energy store in Shoreditch called 1948. Some of you may know of it, some of you may not. It's like similar to Mercer Street type of store. And I was kind of brought in under the guise or under the kind of purview of one sort of leader or creative director or kind of manager or spearhead of the Nike energy marketing team or something along those kind of lines. And then um, that person ended up leaving just before we, we opened the store, but they kind of handed it over to another person who had a, kind of the same taste as them. So we stayed and we were okay. But as soon as they, that person, so those kind of two bosses I kind of had in the beginning, then as soon as the third boss came in with, you know, I don't know, four years into the term of us being in the store, we started to notice changes because clearly they had a different direction or different idea of what they wanted Nike to represent and who they wanted to represent it and what they wanted, you know, them to look like. And over time, that new person, when they came in, slowly but surely got rid of us and replaced us with new people because they wanted to start afresh. And I think that happens a lot with creative directors. And so it happens a lot even in football when a new kind of, you know, owner takes over, a new chairman, a new sporting director, they usually have their own manager they have in mind who they want to, you know, spearhead their 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 flipping plan and they also have players they identify maybe a style of play and i think it was the same way in fashion so this was always going to be the choice it was always going to be somebody that wasn't on the list that we heard already because i think that list that featured grace wall bonner that featured martin rose that featured samuel ross and a few others and um sorry the guy from um telfar clemens and a few other people i think that list was a list that was made up by the previous person and then this guy who took over clearly wanted to you know um write his own you know his own chapter in the Louis Vuitton history books and decided to go with somebody fresh and then obviously picking someone like Pharrell out there as an option would be the best way to kind of go forward with it and it's kind of a ballsy move as also in that regard but then we're going to the final picture here with you know Pharrell covered in this um 
what looks like a big blanket, a Louis Vuitton blanket, right? And he looks really cool in it. And it's a really captivating picture and whatnot. And I think in general, this probably is one of the reasons why they kind of want to get him involved because I think of iconic Louis Vuitton imagery. I think of Pharrell holding a really amazing mink, I think scarf, LV scarf, maybe during the Mark Jacobs era. I think of Pharrell Williams' contribution to the flipping millionaire glasses and stuff and how popular they were after a while, right? Those glasses were everywhere. I remember when they dropped and people were buying them and trying to resell them, even back when they originally dropped. And now they're worth, you know, way more than they were back then. Virgil Abbott did his own iteration of that, you know, millionaire when he was at Louis Vuitton that was super popular too. For some reason with the gays, I don't know why gay guys love millionaires, but it's become really popular with them. And there's another iteration of them also with that kind of mo that kind of star monogram type thing in the middle that gay guys tend to kind of like, obviously so it done pretty well and i think of there's loads of you know, i can think of more maybe with trunks as well of you know um, pharrell holding lv trunks and whatnot so the imagery around pharrell and El louis vuitton has kind of been long lasting as much as he's been associated with chanel and stuff that kind of wrangles true so i can definitely understand why they're going with it that way because you'd imagine somebody who has such impeccable taste that he has right i'd imagine you know i'd always describe pharrell as like a consumer consumer right one of the most high level consumers out there so for sure that would make sense why they'd kind of pick him but the issue that I kind of have with it, and I think it's kind of a little bit of a problem, because I don't think the fa the fashion industry has been really honest and upfront about it, is that it really does set a bad precedent. And it probably is a little bit demoralizing if you're a kid out there at the moment going to Parsons, going to Central St. Martins, going to University of the Arts and other places as well that, you know, study fashion and whatnot. It can be quite demoralizing to see somebody who has absolutely zero fashion um, knowledge, experience, um, at all in the industry getting such a prestigious quote-unquote job um, because essentially what you're being told now in real clear HD 4k is that it doesn't really matter what you know if you've got some level of clout some level of notoriety some level of hype behind your name you've got a decent following on your own regard you can essentially be put plug and play style into any house that you want we've seen it already happening with Virgil RIP we've obviously seen it happening with what's going on with Matthew Williams at Givenchy I think Heron Preston right, he's doing his own namesake brand but I think he'll probably be the next one of that group probably getting plugged in we saw what um what you call it jerry from fear of god did with i forgot the italian brand that he was hooked up with that he was doing collections with so clearly i think these brands and these houses and these conglomerates fashion conglomerates have seen the value of tapping into these guys and gals who already have their inbuilt crowd their inbuilt following and just giving them access to their resources to their production to their team to present a collection and you would imagine for the most part i think it's like a well-run football club if you have a well-run football club that has a vision for how they want to play they have a vision for what kind of players they want to recruit what kind of culture they want to permeate how they want to be seen in the world of football blah 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 and you insert any decent manager around the world who has a winning mentality who can get along well with players who can you know integrate young players can get you tune out older players whatever maybe you're betting if you're a chairman or sporting director that nine times out of ten or maybe not eight times out of ten seven times out of ten you're going to hit a home run it's fairly difficult not to hit a home run and i think we already saw a little bit of it with the kid super guy the kid super guy what's his name calm delane right um he did one collection with louis vuitton and for me i thought it was a diet version of virgil but what you can't say was that it was made poorly it didn't look made poorly. It looked very expensive, very high quality, very refined, um, very well made, very well produced, or everything else you want to say. So clearly, they've set up, they've got a setup going on there at LVMH with Louis Vuitton where you can essentially plug in anybody, even somebody that hasn't any fashion experience, and they can produce a pretty decent collection. Or somebody that's got fashion experience in a very short space of time can turn it around. The only issue, obviously, with Pharrell is that I don't necessarily see him as a fashion dude. I never have. I've seen him more like as a tastemaker culturally, but he's never really screamed fashion to me. He just screamed, if anything, style and the ability to put really cool, interesting pieces together and and kind of find beautiful things and highlight them and whatnot from his jewelry, so details that he has, all this sort of stuff, whatever. But a lot of it for me comes from my time growing up and kind of seeing his evolution over time. And I think I've always been obsessed with Pharrell when it comes to the music side of things, when it comes to the creativity side of things, when it comes to the goal setting 
certain side of things and just the life messages and whatnot. I think of some of the old, you know, um, babe kind of DVDs and these interviews he was giving back in the day and his hip hop interviews from, from back when he was doing Neptune's things. And, you know, I see a lot of kind of positive influences and things. So I've gotten from it from back in the day, but then those times until now, he never really struck me as somebody that I would trust to put together a good full collection. And I think to myself of the history of Pharrell making clothes and even at the height of when Billionaire Boys Club was good because it's no longer good. Let's just put that out there because I think people are trying to rewrite history. Billionaire Boys Club is trash now. And back when ice cream was a thing as well, right? His skateboarding kind of offshoot team thing that he was doing that was, in my opinion, probably one of the most culturally important things that he probably ever did in the scene, really, in terms of what that did in terms of kind of pro profiling and platforming and bringing to the collective quote unquote masses the idea of, you know, black skaters or just non white skaters overall and kind of opening up that channel to people i'm sure there are loads of kids out there who probably had no you know vision of skating until they kind of saw pharrell um pushing ice creams and whatnot and seeing what's his name was it terry richardson terry kennedy i've got the guy skating them things back in the day that was a big deal but even at the height of being a boys club when it was really sick the person that was really behind it making it really amazing was nego and skating if i remember correctly again i'm flying off the seat in my pants if i remember correctly uh, being a boys club was actually founded by um, you know what you call it Nico and Pharrell in the first place Nico kind of recognized Pharrell had good taste and had good ideas and just when he started kind of pushing stuff and doing collaborations on under Bape he said why don't just make another brand you know back then especially when you think about those Japanese legendary streetwear brands back in the day especially someone like my idol Hiroshi Fujiwara they were very open and loose and free with setting up little brands you know pumping out some products putting them together some cool little pieces collections and then just shutting it down after a while they weren't really precious about it they like just kind of have all these little offshoots I think of Hiroshi he's got like probably 10 plus brands that he's done over the course of his career some of them are going some of them are defunct and that approach was really really cool so obviously if Nigo kind of put the battery for us back and said hey I can provide you with stuff I've got access to certain people I can put you in touch with and that's why the early, early, early um, ice cream stuff, if I'm not mistaken, was actually produced by Bape. Again, I don't, could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure being early being the Boys Club was made via Bape. And a lot of that stuff was obviously designed as well, graphic design-wise, by Skate Thing, who did some of the best graphics for Bape back in the day. So a lot of that stuff kind of came from that collaboration. Apart from that, I can't think of many things clothes-wise. Again, he's done really good accessories, really good small little capsule collections, but I can't think of anything in terms of a full collection that I've seen from Pharrell that would give me any confidence this is going to be actually good i can't think of it the only thing i can think of is you know pharrell's got this human race thing that he does with the creams um and uh you know and the self-care and the soaps and whatnot and if i'm not mistaken they've also got like a version of it that's like yeezy type basics but just in like more brighter colors essentially instead of it being washed out you know grays and camels and pinks it's like more ready poppy purpley bluey you know happy kind of colors that pharrell will be associated with and even that stuff i don't think is that impressive so there's not a lot of references you can kind of look at and see and think okay here's what he's designed he's going to be cool you can find a lot of cool outfits of pharrell you can find a cool moments in culture of him for sure but in terms of being able to design i don't see it so if all the people out there that were questioning and having issues about you know virgil being the creative director of louis vuitton men's you should be probably way more concerned with this because at least virgil had off-white at least he had Pyrex vision. At least he was putting together stuff and collaborations underneath the sun that he was doing, obviously, with Ben Cho and other things going forward. Pharrell doesn't have anything. So I think it's a really big step for him to take. But it probably is the only logical thing to do now at his stage of his career. What else can he do? He's just probably achieved everything else outside of it. But he probably would have been helped to maybe have had a step in between going forward. Or maybe as well, the other thing I was thinking is that maybe this was a capsule collection that was in the works because I think... Um, what's his name Virgil did do loads of things like that during his time at Louis Vuitton he had a ongoing collaboration and continuation of a story between him and Nigo that they were doing that wasn't the greatest in my opinion but you know the story around it is still pretty much better than what they produced from it so maybe there was already plans to get Pharrell involved also but obviously, you know, uh, Virgil unfortunately passed away. So that kind of scuppered those plans. So maybe that was that was part of the process of hiring him. Who knows? But in my opinion, I do think it's kind of underwhelming. And I think as a person, it's going to be a lot for him to go from 
you know, working on music, doing what he's doing with his human race and everything that he's doing, humanitarian stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly going to designing, what, four collections a year, right? Um, with the resort included as well and doing every cover collaboration and whatnot going forward. So it's going to be a lot of pressure and it's going to be a lot of, um, it's going to be stuff kind of outside of his kind of purview. But I guess the only other thing to kind of give him respite on that would be that you would imagine, a, you know, a brand like Louis Vuitton probably doesn't really care too much about what the ready to wear does really if you think especially the men's side of things they probably make a lot of their money from you know bags and wallets and perfumes and sunglasses and shit accessories they probably don't make that much money from their ready to wear but that's why the Pharrell collab the Pharrell kind of um sorry that's why the Virgil Abloh appointment was so cool and interesting and, uh, and kind of was a big moment for them because they got to kind of uh have a free shot and they kind of you know hit it out of the park essentially because they got somebody that was a self-sufficient um beast of a guy who wanted to pump out as much product as possible and you know these companies do like to pump out product and you know have stuff kind of filling landfills and choking turtles and stuff so virgil wasn't um shy about pumping out as much stuff as possible he obviously went to tell interesting stories he went to coll collaborate and connect he wasn't too proud or high and mighty for that sort of thing and he obviously revered and loved the brand also so was speaking very highly about it in public and kind of adding to its allure and luster so it's, for me it's very interesting to see someone like Pharrell who went on a really big campaign to kind of talk about how he was selling all his old jewelry to kind of rid himself and cleanse himself of this and start a new chapter and not hold on to things and you can't take stuff with you when you pass away to now suddenly being plugged into LVMH and essentially be responsible for pumping out an untold amount of like unnecessary bull crap because even if he hits out a part there's going to be a few bits that in there that are going to be just you know whatever that are going to end up being clogged up somewhere in some outlet somewhere collecting dust or trying to be peddled to some you know unsuspecting middle east person under the guise that this is the only one that exists or something that's going to happen for sure so it's very you know there's there's some sort of level of hypocrisy in there in one minute you're selling all your stuff to get rid of it next minute you're linking up your vmh and you're going to be responsible for many turtles kind of you know being belly up flipping at the bottom of the ocean somewhere but hey you got to do what you got to do but of course in terms of what it does for the kids is pretty sick they're gonna be able to see you know somebody you know who's they kind of respect as a genius on one side of things in terms of music and the challenges and seeing them kind of do it in real time and be able to kind of relay that message or how they do things or cross over to fashion which i don't think is going to end well personally for me and the one thing that made me think in the end of it that kind of made me laugh when i saw this immediately was like if you're a fashion student out there thinking and seeing for real kind of get this job the one thing that kind of came to mind was this iconic clip of um Kanye West having a sit down with um Zane Lowe back in the day when he said this iconic thing about Lady Gaga being the creative director of Polaroid. And what he said is you are a celebrity. So basically what's going to happen is there's product here. And this is where you end up right here. If you can communicate this product, you can make money off the product. Cuz look at Gaga, she's the creative director of Polaroid. I like some of the Gaga songs. What the fuck does she know about cameras? And I guess that's the thing you have to find out about Pharrell. Pharrell makes some good songs. He, you know, he's made some good songs. The recent productions of the last couple of years, five years, or even close to a decade, have not been great. Um, but a lot of misses, in my opinion, especially his own music, hasn't been the greatest. Maybe his mentorship has probably improved, but you know, the quality of his music hasn't been the greatest for me. Especially, I'm talking as a stan, as a fanboy of his. So it's very interesting to see somebody who maybe creatively is at the you know the opposite end of their powers now have it to be in charge of such a you know a demanding brand and job and platform having to kind of pump those flipping things out but one thing it does remind me about thinking about as well a little bit was i remember watching loads of these kind of panel discussions on the show studio that used to really infuriate me because I was thinking I was the only person I was going crazy seeing some of these students um, from fashion schools and really highly respected industry figures, you know, pontificating and getting really annoyed. I remember the early times of like Vetemar when it was doing bits and Balenciaga when them decided to point in there and other brands as well. I can't remember all of them, but I do remember them having a little real stick up their ass about brands that had become popular in the quote unquote streets with people, right? Real life people were buying these things and were really interested into it and were 
got kind of invested into the story, blah, blah, blah. And for some reason, fashion people just couldn't figure out why is this popular? Why is this good? You should be, you should be fanboying over this brand, over that brand, over that designer. And for some reason, there was a lack of understanding or accepting of what the reality of the situation is. And I guess, unfortunately for everybody involved, celebrity culture has kind of permeated and it's kind of at the level now where you have that girl from Love Island becoming the crave director of flipping pretty little thing and stuff. And that only happens because brands realize the value of having these people who are well known in their own regard kind of get plugged into what you're already doing so what they're essentially doing what they're hoping which is what these collaborations are doing they're hoping that you know one plus one equals two they're hoping if they plug you into their brand to give resources that you need to do you'll kind of bring across your inbuilt fan base and you also might gain a few more fans by the stuff that you produce so you're essentially hoping that their inbuilt fan base can kind of translate over and they can also produce given the access to the resources that you have so that you can make that money back and you know gain whatever you kind of gain going forward and this has kind of been the case for a while maybe for 10 years plus but we probably just you know maybe as people that are into fashion just didn't want to accept it but this is currently where we're at but i've just still have the feeling that the gatekeepers obviously there are some them out there who are still perpetuating this lie and this myth that you have to go to fashion school in order to become the you know the creative director or the head of whatever brand or whatever house and whatever line collection may be out there and clearly we've seen evidence that it's not the case like you know we've seen it catalogued over time and it's going to become more frequent going forward and i can definitely see you know some of these popping you know young streetwear brands and instagram brands that exist out there don't be surprised if you see some of those dudes you know suddenly becoming the head of whatever high fluent brand out there because sooner rather later these these guys these kind of like you know pharrell generations virgil generations harry Presson's even 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 matthew williams they're going to soon become the older guys the kind of guys that kind of are out of touch and then soon they big conglomerates are going to start looking under, underneath them and start thinking okay what's the next tier going forward and you're already kind of seeing a little bit going forward what's Ian Connor's doing with Pastel and how he's got ownership of that and he's kind of trying to bring that back up and obviously I'd imagine try and launch it as a more serious fashion brand because he's already got his sicker thing going on so I could definitely envision envision a future going forward where the likes of you know um, what's his name where the likes of uh, ASAP Bari and stuff like that gets plugged into a really high fluent fashion brand because they want to plug in he's already existing brand he has been flown and plug that into your brand you know create relevance that way communication that way and whatnot and hope the kids kind of gravitate to it this is definitely going to be going forward so if you are going to fashion school you're going to it because you want to you want to learn how to pattern cut you want to learn how to do various other things and you know just have that experience of going to fashion school fair play but if you are legitimately going there under the guys you want to do that so you can become the next head of louis vuitton then you've seen evidence of it that's not the fact if anything it might be beneficial to actually work a real job quote unquote and actually just build your fashion brand on the side and actually kind of you you know kind of start it yeah build it on the side like you would do a startup or a small business and kind of go through it that way but whatever you know maybe there's a cashier going to a school and being connected with that school and going to events i'm not really too sure but i would imagine that'd be a far better use of people's resources than actually just committing for to just the education and hoping that kind of gets you places because there's been many people i know of them who've gone to fashion school graduated with high results and good results and good references and whatnot and have been able to land a fashion job it's not as easy because obviously you know um it's a pretty competitive industry out there there's a lot of really good people out there who don't have positions so so you're battling with a lot of people so it would be nice to see a more variety of kids doing interesting things going forward i think it's different maybe overall in international but i feel like in london in the uk specifically there is a lot of still relevance and importance being placed in going to a fashion school over just like actually doing the work in real life and setting up your own label setting up your own brand and trying to actually sell product to actual real life human beings and kind of be able to kind of you know respond to certain things be able to create for a certain market understand business blah 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 positioning retail all those things are really important real life skills people need instead of just kind of focusing on the fashion industry and trying to kind of speak to a very small niche plugged in group of people who don't really affect things on a big global scale so 
in conclusion, I think, in my opinion, it's going to end in tears. This for our appointment as Louis Vuitton men's where career director. But because it's LVMH and because it's Louis Vuitton, it doesn't really matter. Because even if it is a failure, they could just go back to what they should have done, quote unquote, and hire a Martin Rose or a Grace Ward Bonner or a flipping Samuel Ross. But another theory that I'm kind of thinking of now, this is another theory that I'm thinking of. Maybe what's actually happened is that the likes of Martin Rose, Grace Ward Bonner, Samuel Ross, uh, Telfar Clemens, and a few other people, maybe they actually turned down the job. Maybe they turned down the job. Maybe they realized the importance of trying to build their own legacy and knowing that maybe they're all too young in their journey to be plugged into LVMH and doing that kind of role. Maybe they would prefer to build their own brand to a level where maybe later on down the line, similar to maybe the opposite of what flipping Phoebe Philo has kind of done with her career and then do that when you're a bit older, that kind of regard. Maybe there's that kind of thing going in there. So maybe LVMH didn't have any choice but to hold her the cold, delaying kid super trash and then hire Pharrell. Maybe they didn't have the option because all the options they wanted basically said no and kind of turned them down. That could be definitely something that kind of played into it. Um, but for me, I still think it's going to end in tears. It's not going to end right. But, you know, they got, they got to try something. they got to do something. If anything, I would have preferred them just to go a completely different direction and not try and be somewhat culturally relevant or try to cater or pander to, some people would say, to blacks or whatnot, or urban folks. I think that would have been probably a better way to go about doing things and kind of reset the brand in some way, shape or form. But I do also understand the kind of, the relevance in culture and communication and whatnot that would mean to it because you're hoping with Pharrell's celebrity as well you know that front row is going to be absolutely ridiculous if you thought you know Virgil's you know show was a flipping clout party then you can imagine you know Pharrell's first fashion show at Louis Vuitton is going to be a clout festival so it's going to be absolutely insane that front row so they're obviously planning to get a lot of clicks and engagement through that through that appointment um, there's probably going to be a few um, you know viral bits and bobs that'll go around here and there but i don't know for me i don't necessarily see the guy as a fashion dude i see him more as a cultural icon a tastemaker a really high level consumer who's able to put together the odd cool capsule collection and collaboration here or there but also i understand how well run these fashion conglomerates are and if you do plug in somebody that has a molecule of taste and a, an and opinion and a perspective on clothes they should be able to do a good job and virgil obviously showed us he did the same thing as well despite all the complaints people had about his collections he still was able to put together by in my estimate i would say you know anywhere between a six to eight out of ten collections every season he didn't really go under under that and i think that's what they need you know in terms of um, louis vuitton and if you can get them you know some sort of you know attention and spins online and stuff that also kind of helps but if you can deliver six to eight out of ten collections every year you know keep stuff you know somewhat on the up and up you're gonna be doing okay you're gonna be okay going forward but hey what do i know when it comes to that stuff in it i'm just a little old silly boy what the hell do i know then next we're going to mention this so i think this is kind of speaks upon everything that's been going on with the pharrell thing and I think it's really interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn. So this is regarding the New York Fashion Week pro debut of Heron Preston. So Heron Preston obviously has been doing his brand for a while. Sorry, for a while now. But he decided to go back home and present his collections because he's been doing, I think he did some in Milan where I think New Gods Group is based, if I'm not mistaken. And then obviously he showed his collection sometimes in Paris because that's become like the menswear flipping destination of choice now going forward, which is a little bit annoying, a little bit cringe. But he's now decided to go back to New York and present it there. And I think this actually tells a far better story for Aaron Preston, especially when you feel familiar with the guy because I've kind of met him, you know, once or twice here and there. And he's a really cool dude and he has a real deep connection with New York and everything around it, his upbringing and his blog and all this sort of stuff so it makes complete sense that he'd go back and debut there and if there's anybody that could kind of maybe revive new york fashion week and bring some level of kind of hype and anticipation behind it in the kind of streetwear side of things i think he'd be the kind of great person to do it so and i really like his approach to it especially with the after parties and whatnot going forward so i think him going back to new york is a great idea absolutely love it those are the collection and i have to be honest 
even though I love the guy, to be completely brutally, brutally honest, it may have been one of the most meh collections I've seen for a while in terms of the pieces and what they look like on the runway. If anything, I've seen a lot more maybe refinement in terms of what the pieces actually look like. But in terms of the overall approach to what you would call fashion with a capital F, I'm starting to get a little bit bored of this myself, to be fair. Like, I don't necessarily think streetwear type clothing looks that great on the runway. Maybe this is kind of something that everybody kind of understands but i think i've kind of come to that realization this is coming coming from somebody who is a fervent a fur you know a balls deep 100 percent authentic flipping streetwear fanatic and fan and i can definitely say i think runways don't necessarily need to be plastered with streetwear looks after streetwear looks it just doesn't really pop the same way that fashion with a capital f does because i think there's meant to be a level of refinement a level of escapism a level of i don't know something that's kind of you're meant to be doing if you're doing runway shows i don't think they should look like this in my opinion so maybe that's the issue but of course one of the best things about these type of things is that they're at cultural events um you're more there for the person who's designing them and who's walking the runway and there's a lot of De there's a lot of kind of attention to detail that goes into those kind of things I don't think regular fashion brands do or maybe they're more plugged in I guess streetwear brands because I guess that's the nature of streetwear in general you're more attuned to all these different references and stuff that plug you into culture that plug you into actually what's going on in the streets so those kind of rain into it so everything from the music to the flipping the models that get casted to the pictures people taking BTS pictures and shit it all kind of ties into it but when I saw this question I was like you know what first thing first I liked it and it looked great there's some good pieces here and there like this look that bloody Osiris has on with these big massive flipping yeti ski boot type things and the jacket and i'm really 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 loving the pop of that logo now on the bottom sleeve that's kind of permeating throughout flipping hair and pressing products it's really cool that in this very short space of time he's been able to kind of create a new piece of branding for himself outside of the style stuff because i thought the style stuff was cool but i thought it got really corny very quickly it's kind of similar to those kind of go faster Balenciaga Oakley type glasses they got corny very quickly as soon as AliExpress started making them and everyone started wearing them they got very very corny very quickly whereas uh, same thing happened with that style right written in kind of the Russian Slyric uh, Slyric however it's called right and font I think now he's kind of switched over and kind of you know used the branding of that woven orange tab label on the bottom of the sleeve of the jackets I think that works really really well but when I'm looking at the collection and get hair press and pick up him running down the running down the, the flipping runway, very odd way of running there, but big up him regardless. I just think, I don't know. After a while, this level of you know bringing these type of collections down the runway it can get a little bit tiring seeing you know jackets and hoodies and jeans and t-shirts down the runway especially done in this kind of way it can just get a little bit like meh this is not something that you should be maybe presenting at all times on runway so i'm not too sure if the future going forward there should be like a separate you know shows for street weary type stuff i'm not really sure how it should go but i can't imagine anybody looking at this and thinking oh this is dreamy i must have this i must have that that's the thing i think as well there's not the, the level of desirability when it comes to um fashion collections or streetwear the streetwear influence fashion collections on the runway isn't necessarily there i just don't think it's not very desirable i'm not really looking at stuff i'm dreaming of wearing it. i'm just seeing clothes essentially kind of paraded down the runway it doesn't necessarily give you any sort of sense of wonder lust in any way shape or form but maybe again i'm kind of speaking out of turn i'm not really too sure but one of the really things i enjoyed about um, Aaron Preston's collection he did in new york was was the show invites and how he kind of recycled loads of bits and bobs that he found in the streets and then sent those out as show invites so that there was a kind of full cycle process going on in terms of these kind of found materials being sent out as show invites and if people went to chuck them where they could they already kind of found materials anyway or you could keep them and sort of give and brief new life into things that were destined for the scrap heap and he made a really cool video kind of detailing the whole experience here i think you see a final picture of some of the pieces selected here but here's a picture here's a sorry um, a, a video of where he kind of talks about what his inspiration behind the whole thing was and i really really do like how he kind of communicates his ideas and put them forward and like i said prior don't be surprised if heron preston and samuel ross are probably the next 
group of people or next type next next two people from the kind of school of Virgil, school of Kanye West who then get big fashion jobs going forward. I think they're the next two ones going because they've definitely got their ear to the streets, they definitely know, you know, how to kind of plug themselves into certain things, definitely how to communicate their ideas in certain ways and they just got it. Yeah, you know I mean, regardless of what I think about it closing down the runway, they just have it. And I think this is definitely a way to kind of see it. So this is the video I'm gonna play um with Harry Person talking about it. There's so many materials that can be perfectly used, right? Like it says on the screen this whole idea is about exploring um circularity by design less new stuff i think you guys are here right the full winter show invitation was handpicked by me literally as i searched the streets of new york for discarded objects and materials for anyone's for sorry enough surface area and good enough condition to hold the handwritten deals on my show this body of work turned into close to 400 custom-made invites each unique if discarded they return to trash and if kept it's a treasure to collect either way it's a win it's a fashion show invitation that does not hold a utility then the uh, chances of it being thrown away are very high and wasted these invitations are part of a small look into larger picture of my led practice less environmentally destructive and it, it kind of reminds me if anything reading it it's kind of giving a lot of tom Sachs. it's also giving a lot of something that you may do in college or something like those kind of core interesting fire out ideas that you present and um, somewhat in the pursuit to create a kind of utopian brand that kind of does the best to kind of uplift humanity and all this sort of kind of stuff you know when you're really optimistic back in the day and you're not nihilistic and stuff and you're older that kind of reminds me of this kind of energy so i do like the fact that he kind of maintains that um almost um naivety naivety and kind of kitty part about him when it comes to creating i think that's really Im Im imperative when you're creative to be curious and to be kind of childlike in your approach it kind of does really serve you well the moment you start to become embittered nihilistic and maybe a little bit too critical of things is maybe when the creativity sort of faucet kind of stops in some regard i think so so i do like this approach i really do like this approach anyway back to the video keep those in circulation like why couldn't this just be like a sick invite now it's up to the receiver to contemplate right in their brain like wait a minute you got this off the street what's this trash but now it's used as an invitation do i keep it if I throw it away, well, I, I won't feel so bad about throwing it back away, right? Because that's kind of... He's G-Wagon sick. Marker the circulation it. of invitations anyways, if they're not functional, there's no utility, they kind of end up in the trash. So it's like, I don't feel so bad about returning it back to where it came from. And then just put the sticker right, right in there. Give that a try. Puffs. I wonder if my envelopes are big enough. <laughs> what up? Slightly, slightly gross. Coolest thing I found. I was like, I want a book. But I feel like I, I found this today. It's a fucking book. It's a sheetrock piece of the side paneling of like the kitchen cabinet. The boxy clean bottle. That was kind of cool. Cardboard. There's was like a number so cool. on it. Like, a, is this like to a safe? What is this? I got my invite. I'll take these. Low key, I think there's dog pee on this one. There is a bit of a selection, selective process. <laughs> Cities to me can be looked at like spaces of like of layers of materials right like Let's just stop it there. And obviously, if you see here by the picture, you've got a final selection of some of the pieces that he was able to kind of pick out and kind of use and repurpose as show invites. And it's a pretty cool and sick idea. But I was just thinking about it, looking at it overall. The really interesting flicking story to tell about her impression and his journey to becoming this kind of guy that has an actual legit fashion brand is that when I met him in general, what kind of drew me to him was kind of his communication ability, his ability to kind of communicate ideas, to put 
able to put forward you know different propositions he was always kind of really optimistic as well which i kind of enjoyed and liked and he was kind of young at the time and someone that i can kind of look up to in terms of having to try and get it and try and make things happen in the big city that you're living in but one thing that i really admired about his journey was that in my opinion he was never a fashion guy like i never looked to him as somebody that you would describe even as even stylish back then he was never really someone that had any drip in my opinion he was always somebody that just came across cool and that's something that you don't necessarily get nowadays with kids i feel like i feel like a lot of kids put a lot of value in like what they wear what they listen to and stuff but how they mostly how they present themselves as opposed to what they are as a person and for some reason i don't know how he did it maybe because you know the power of communication through blogs and pictures and whatnot and videos he was able to communicate and permeate uh, a, a vibe of somebody that was inherently just cool without looking cool like he didn't have any like i don't you know maybe he has you know, he obviously had some cool trainers back in the day because we were all buying the same sneakers back then we we're all collecting and we we're all on night talk and shit that might have been added to it but when i think of like outfits and style and looks i can never really picture him wearing any crazy amazing looks if anything he only started to kind of look cool quote unquote when he started to hang out with all the fashion dudes and virgils obviously doing stuff with john making his Givenchy t-shirts hanging out with the Liam mcsweeney and whatnot doing the marriage and whatever because i think there's that famous picture of like you know liam mcsweeney getting flipping um you know um what you call it getting held up by legs and performed you know uh, a, a simulation sect act and allegedly the person in the monkey suit was actually Aaron Bresson I think in the gorilla suit or something so I think when he started to go down that road is when suddenly he started to kind of you know show some acumen for being able to do that but it also maybe shows that if you're creative and you have cool ideas maybe that goes back to the Pharrell thing it doesn't matter what medium you present in you're probably going to smash it if you've got cool ideas you're creative because if you give this guy I'd imagine if you give Aaron Bresson the idea of like you know um uh, re, I don't know, restarting a convenience store and kind of you know outfitting it on the inside and designing the layout and whatnot and the store uniforms and the tail systems and whatnot. You probably be able to do a pretty good idea in terms of understanding how people flow and the traffic and people in the store and habits and whatnot. Probably they could apply it to it. You'd imagine every any regardless of what it is. So it doesn't wouldn't need to be clothes. Wouldn't need to be flipping anything to do with fashion. It could be architecture. It could be flipping consumer products. And you'd imagine you'd be able to present it in a good way. And like I said, I. I, I wonder why nowadays the kids don't have the ability to do that whereas i think one of the good things about the kids now is that a lot of them for the most part they don't see any sort of reverence or importance to being the marketing guy at nike or adidas or like to be the head is you know the head influencer person that i don't know stussy or something they don't care about that thing and i think when my generation we cared about that more we cared about those nike marketing role manage the nike energy marketing role manager roles more we went to know who was doing who was doing that i mean influencer regard roles social media roles we cared about that thing more so Whereas I think these kids nowadays, they want the big jobs or they want to start their own brands or they want to be their own production, you know, have their own production company, have their own film studio, have their own, you know, um, styling, cre um, cre creative consultancy and whatnot. They don't just see themselves as employees, see themselves more as bosses. But like I said, I think a lot of their kind of inherent self-worth comes from the work they produce and it and it always the stuff that they wear but very rarely do you see a lot of them that have that pure undeniable soul of somebody just really cool who kind of gets it and is kind of destined to win and i think heron Preston always kind of had that in him so i think going forward i can definitely see heron being the next guy that ends up getting offered or even maybe he's been approached already for a big fashion uh, label or house job i see him getting it i see obviously um what's his name uh samuel ross being another one and i also think if Givenchy end up making a big mistake and firing matthew williams or parting ways i can definitely see him bouncing straight back up or bouncing straight back and kind of get another role with somebody else because i think the cultural relevancy the the fact that they have the kids in their palm of their hands and they're cool and they're kind of you know attached and linked to certain musical artists and whatnot that goes a real long way with these brands because they know what that does to the metrics behind the scenes and whatnot so i can definitely see 
see them kind of targeting that approach and use that as something to kind of go forward but as always like I said big up Heron Preston for presenting that full winter um, 23 collection it wasn't really my favourite overall I'm kind of getting tired a little bit of seeing streetwear type stuff on the runway I'm not sure it's the best real medium and platform for it but I do see some improvement and some real panache and finish and you can definitely tell that there's a production company that are putting this together or sorry that are producing and manufacturing a lot of the bits obviously because he's working with new guys group the same people that were kind of in business with Virgil and it definitely helps in terms of putting out your ideas and kind of having a coherent theme message kind of running through and the quality standards obviously really really much improved but I just not too sure if this kind of requires a runway that's the one thing that's kind of really I'm kind of women and are about if you're a kind of a streetwear person should you really be putting yourself on a runway and does it kind of somewhat have the opposite kind of thing in terms of you know how it kind of has your brand being perceived but again maybe i'm talking out my ass who bloody knows who bloody knows let's quickly want to touch upon this because i think this is really cool and i really did like this so this is courtesy of vogue runway and i'm really going to talk about regarding the diesel don't diesel stuff i said diesel i said d squared um collection because i really like the hats and i really have a kind of vibe with the hats and i think in general the theme of the show kind of remind me a lot of yellowstone a lot of cowboy type motifs you know very you know obviously done in a very uh, queer gay lgbtq kind of way but one thing i really did appreciate was some of the hats the trucker hats were so good and i'm definitely you know one of the people out there that would criticize and laugh and you know snicker at people not nigger snicker i said by the way uh, at people who would wear those d square hats with icon on them but now i kind of get them d squared know how to make good hats so number one they've got this hat here on look free where they've got like a fake tiara on the head if you can see here of the hat it looks pretty cool then you have this hat here that says 24 7 star that you know i'm gonna get that's like a essentially kind of looks like what you'd imagine what they i think they give those hats to like you know vietnam war vets and stuff it's like that kind of admiral type hat with the you know with the nice kind of foil kind of leaf embroidery on the brim and a nice kind of font down the front which i obviously am a big fan of you got more tiara hats there you got a nice hat there with the badge down the front there with this model that's got the buccal fat taken out of those cheeks and then you've got this other one with the big logo on the front with a d squared written on it <laughs> And again, for me, all of these things are only kind of options because of the last few months or, you know, I've kind of decided or I've kind of been a fan of getting my hair braided so I can actually wear these hats. At the moment, it's obviously going to be a bit of a myth. But once my hair is actually braided and I've got cornrows, these will be a, definitely a solution that I can kind of go forward with. But I love these style of hats. They look really, really well done. You've got another one here that says, uh, what does it say here? It says live, what does it say? Live doll? living doll sorry my eyesight is so bad right now so this is living doll here which i really really like um you've got some other ones there with a the pine remark on them you've got another one here that says i love beer but i don't know obviously you know out and walking that show is absolutely amazing probably one of the best walks i've seen of men's actually he's been absolutely smashing it on a runway but overall i looked at d square full winter um, 2023 and the thing that really plugged into me was the hats you could definitely see me wearing this look here right look number 25 absolutely looks amazing i love everything about it but the snapback hats the trucker hats are definitely something that kind of popped out to me which you'd imagine is a shame if you're a designer right you spend all this time creating this amazing collection thinking about every little detail right you look at these shorts it looked 25 and you think a lot of attention detail went into deciding if, if the if the pockets in the front here should be a zip should be a velcro should be a button closure the length of the short the hem the zip the fly button all this stuff goes into it and then a person like myself sees the collection and the first thing i get drawn to is the flipping snapback hats right that's the first thing i want to kind of jump on but I do like all of those. And of course, one of the other looks I really did enjoy was this look here. Look number 28. They've got these really cool motocross kind of inspired type of pants with the names of the twins who are um, at the forefront or, you know, behind D squared in Dean and Dan, um, which look really nice. And they've obviously worn them, which I'd never really 
had an idea of wearing them with kind of essentially what you'd call cowboy boots right these are kind of mountaineering kind of mid-calf type boots with a uh, motorcycle pants i do like the look of those going forward so those are really 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 nicely done and of course they've got their own version of cowboy boots they put together that i really like the look of but yeah the hats and obviously you've got this big fuzzy trapper hat that's been all the rage that style i think louis vuitton did one virgil did actually one that obviously bari has been wearing and flossing around the place but these sort of mink type style furry type trapper hats are really well done but yeah the snapback trucker hats from um d, d squared for winter 23 would definitely stand out for me during this men's um fashion week that i really liked or men's paris fashion week that happened a few months ago that i was a really big fan of and i'm definitely got my eye on a few of them that 24 7 star one is definitely something that i'm definitely looking at to get very very soon when it does eventually drop the one with the tiara looks very interesting and in and in, in there obviously you can see the twins behind um d squared looking amazing here at the end of the runway clearly been doing all their bicep curls and eating all their steaks and intermittent fasting and whatnot looking skinny tall and hot but yeah those trucker hats those hats are definitely something i'm going to add to my list of things going forward and i think you should too if you're a fan of hats and you've got a big cranium like i have those are a good way to kind of style and kind of you know um, add a little bit of extra style points to your outfits especially if you wear boring all black outfits like i do on the regular especially if you wear all black boring outfits like i do on the regular next i'm going to mention this and see what you guys think so obviously i said before or i mentioned it already in the podcast and most of you are already aware that alessandro Michelli has you know left gucci and he's no longer in a building and they're now going in a completely different direction but they haven't really announced who's taking over it's kind of like an in-house type of thing if i'm not mistaken um and they presented their new collection obviously at paris fashion week or paris men's fashion week sorry a few weeks ago already in january but one thing i wanted to quickly mention that i thought was interesting was that the complete pivot obviously to a different kind of aesthetic than what kind of you know um the kitschy type of eccentric vibe that alessandro was going for when he was at gucci has been completely kind of gone they've completely kind of reset the entire brand even from color palettes and whatnot you think about the first look setting a precedent here in look number one you got a basic white t-shirt some nice tan um trousers here nice relaxed fit with a bag and a beanie hat this is completely opposite of what you would imagine um alessandro would have put down the runway in terms of his inspirations and his kind of taste levels so clearly this was kind of very intentional in that regard but i also think overall it's very average and very kind of there's no real moments in any of this stuff that's really kind of drawing you and kind of making you think oh you have to have any this is not a lot of kind of desirability in any of these pieces and i'm wondering still to this day considering what alessandro did for gucci and what they did for him obviously you know collaboration it worked it was mutually beneficial relationship i still am perturbed as to why he didn't get a send-off why couldn't he have presented one last show during paris men's fashion week just to kind of you know thank him for the hard work and especially you know maybe like a even not even a maybe like a co-ed show or something just to kind of thank him for what he done and present one last look at that kind of show because i feel like this is too much of an abrupt change and it also isn't too much of a change because if anything it feels like a high fashion version of what cos would do or maybe it's what cos are doing now because they're catching up with high fashion brands some of them and some of the high fashion brands aren't really pushing themselves too far going forward but there is a really big feeling of like meh in this and it, if anything it also kind of reminds me a little bit of Isabel Moran like Isabel Moran men's like I look at Isabel Moran men's and I think I've mentioned it prior and somebody's corrected me and said oh many people in France actually wear it but I think if it is Moran men's I think to myself who's wearing this stuff like who are you making it for who are you producing it for this is just going to get filled in some landfill somewhere in some poor turtle as i mentioned prior is going to be you know passed away and choking on all this stuff and I look at this gucci collection i think to myself who is buying this gucci collection having been kind of inundated with the gucci of prior years which is covered in monograms and prints and bright colors and kitschy alternative and crazy things that kind of challenge you and push you but also are a bit fun and don't take themselves too seriously who's going to swap that for this like this you know onesie leather embossed gucci kind of thing like it's just all kind of trashy and tacky so i'm wondering if whether 
behind the scenes something maybe more sinister happened with Alessandra at Flipping Gucci, which is what resulted them to kind of changing him very quickly and abruptly and not giving him a real official send up and allowing him to come down the runway one more time. I don't really too sure because this doesn't look great in my opinion. It's very basic, very average. It doesn't necessarily um, you know, stir or attract you the same way that Alessandro's version of Gucci did in the past. But maybe that's the whole point going forward. Maybe that's the whole point going forward. Who bloody knows? Then I'm going to mention this as well, right? This is something I mentioned before regarding Nina Kravitz. I think this is pretty interesting because it throws up an interesting challenge here. So this is courtesy of RA and it features Avalon Emerson announcing her indie leading project, Avalon Emerson and the Charm. It says Avalon Emerson has announced a new indie leading project. Um, the first single, Sandrail, sorry, Sandrail Silhouette is out on Friday. So are you out now if you're listening to this um, on Another Dove, a new label from the US star, US artist in AD93, Nick Tasker, co-produced by Emerson and Bullion. The track combines jangly melancholic guitars with cello and Emerson's wistful vocals. The seed of Sandrail started in LA a few years ago. My wife Hunter strumming on her jazz master and me plucking some chords on my um, hydra synth, Emerson said. I I brought the snippets into the studio with Bullion and we laid out a few minutes of it and added some drums and I wrote some vocal melodies and lyrical um, thoughts of things that were on my mind lately. Then a couple of days later, my old friend Arizona Kevian, Kevian come into the studio to add some cello to another song and we played him the Sandro sketch and nearly instantly he wrote the cello parts. She added to me, this song is about scale, scales to my time and how something that seemed so important, defining a long time ago might not really matter that much now Sandra Silhouette follows oh, 0606 Emerson's recent EP on AD93 and Eternal September collaborative project with Anunku as A and A now I've heard this track and I can say you know objectively speaking from my taste I think it's very average and um, a lot of this comes from me just maybe being um, a little bit having more experience listening to indie music prior than getting into dance music i think i've had the benefit and the luxury and the opportunity to be kind of you know have decent i feel like musical education in terms of the type of stuff i'm into i don't necessarily care about genres or whatnot as long as it's good i'm going to listen to it and i feel like that approach has kind of served me well when it comes to djing because i feel like in general i'm pretty well rounded in terms of my approach and my ability to kind of put together coherent and good sets and recognize what's good and what isn't but one thing i have recognized overall is like i think in dance music there are many people involved in it in electronic music specifically who maybe aren't that real plugged in or have great taste when it comes to anything outside of the genre that they play so when they do venture in into becoming an artist and trying to become you know tr trying to stand in, in front of a microphone and maybe do it that way instead of doing a dj thing it can come across a bit corny a little bit a little bit cringe a little bit um just badly done and i think the first person i think of is you know nina kravis debuting her um you know artist kind of persona i think it was like coachella or something right and it was absolutely horrifying and i think over time it got a little bit better and i think her recent track she put out where she's like frolicking somewhere in the beach was a lot better than that first performance but it was still bad but then as a dj i also look at it and i think to myself i understand or i can definitely sympathize with the with the dilemma that's kind of going through you right if you're an artist or if you're a dj where you maybe think djing is quite limiting and it's quite boring at some regard if you regard if you're especially at the top level i think of you know seeing flipping dicks and that cocoa and i was actually standing there looking at it thinking it must be horrible if you're addiction if you're that level where essentially you kind of have to play the hits people are there kind of expecting you to play your well-known hits and stuff you can't just come there and do like a crappy thing you have to kind of you can't sorry you can't go there and kind of test yourself and play new fresh tunes you kind of have to deliver the hits and the hits are what everyone's kind of known you from playing and boiler rooms and other kind of sets over there so you kind of you know got these golden handcuffs on in terms of your sets and the music that you play and you're kind of constricted to it because obviously you're playing other people's music also and also you don't want to be that dj that kind of just only plays their own productions because that's another level of wankery no one wants to be associated with so you want to try and challenge yourself and open up your horizon and try something 
something new and fresh and interesting. You try and be an artist and do that thing, and it doesn't necessarily sit and hit either. Maybe you don't really have it. Maybe it's an evolution that's going to take time, but it also it will take time. It's not instant. And, you know, sometimes in music, unfortunately, if somebody does produce something quite terrible, more often than not, because of the amount of stuff coming out, you're probably not going to give the second thing they put out a chance because you remember the first thing you listened to was absolutely shocking. So when I heard this track, Sandra's Silhouette, the first thing I thought about was that it was quite forgettable. It wasn't anything quite interesting about it. But then I also think to myself, like, it must be challenging because, you know, Avalon Emerson is like at the pinnacle, at the top of her craft when it comes to DJing. Definitely one of the top DJs out there and definitely somebody that a lot of people are big fans of. You have to look at her flipping mixes online and stuff and streams to see the numbers of people who watch them. Um, the comments are always incredibly positive and nice because she, I guess she just comes across as a very nice human being. So people kind of connect with her very well in that regard. Maybe the approach to the style, the music, the mixing style, whatever it is, something about her people just love as a DJ. That's always not going to resonate as a musician or as an artist. It's not always going to be the same thing, especially I would imagine because they're different crowds. As much as I would say, I'm somebody that listens to all music and so go to all different types of festivals and whatnot. And I don't really care about genres. There are definitely people who are way more into indie and alternative type music and don't care about dance music or church music in the slightest. And when they hear what you're doing and then they hear some, you know, random band that they don't know about in some dingy bar somewhere where they bought tickets and dice playing much better music than you, it's going to be hard to kind of equate or figure out in their head why you're on Coachella and this band is playing in Old Blue Last for free on a Wednesday. So that's the problem. The competition in that field is so, so deep. And I don't necessarily think this track or this project maybe is at that kind of level. But will it take time to get there? Maybe. Um, will it eventually get there? Maybe. But I also understand and see, again, having listened to Dixon play at Coco and got completely bored out of my skull and just staring at him playing the same records I've heard him play every single other time. I've, well, not every single time, but you know the similar sort of sound I've heard him play. It also made me think and have sympathy for the popular well-known DJ out there, like the Solomons, the Harveys, um, you know, the Seth Truckers and stuff. It must be a little bit exhausting after a while because people are expecting a certain sound for me you a certain type of set you obviously don't want to disappoint them you just want to get help to have their money's worth and you also just might be tired and going to auto drive um and just kind of and you know just do the bare minimum and kind of play what you know works and kind of get out there and go back to doing what you actually enjoy doing so maybe that is what spurned this project and maybe you know you should just kind of do the things you want to actually do and hope they kind of figure out and not just be kind of shackled to things that you don't like because that's the that's another kind of horror as well right like where you're really talented at something but you don't necessarily love it or that you become successful at something but you don't necessarily your passion that can be its own type of horror so i could definitely understand stand that going forward but for me it was very forgettable i didn't really like anything about it and i kind of turned it off pretty quickly after listening to the first two minutes or so so i'm not really sure where it's going to go but again you never know it may kind of progress and go forward from there so big up avalon emerson regardless big up avalon emerson regardless this one to mention this which i think is pretty cool so this is courtesy of ra and it's about london's phonics it said london's phonics announces residencies with core super john talabot and kilimanjaro now it says South London nightclub um, Phonics has announced this program for February through to April. February residence is Cole Super, who play every Friday alongside Amelia and um, Tarza. Um, other highlights include Op Optimo and Lindemann in March. It's going to be John Talbot and Rising Star Kilimanjaro in April. I want to mention this because I think Phonics' approach to programming has always impressed me. This kind of monthly residency thing, I really, really like. It's obviously maybe a bit more cost effective for the club to get somebody to lock down to residency for a month, you'd imagine, as opposed to booking them for a one off gig. So maybe there's a kind of really basic economic side of things. But I think one of the things that I always kind of hated about London nightlife. And especially as an up and coming DJ myself, is that we don't really have residencies anymore. Maybe it's not even a London thing, maybe it's a global thing. Maybe there is no residencies in the overall, but I don't think it's really true because I think there's regular there's bars I've been to in Berlin where they have a particular person that always plays on a Friday night or a Saturday night, regardless of who the kind of quote unquote headliner is. And I feel like that kind of lack of residency overall, it kind of has if I'm if, if I'm to be somewhat critical, I think has kind of contributed to this culture of headliner only 
thing that we have in the London club scene where people only want to buy tickets to the headliner event. They want to have big names, you know, headlining, co-headlining and stuff. It's absolutely crazy. So that these resident nights aren't necessarily a priority because clubs are already, you want to chase the bag and make the money back they can by booking the really big famous person and hoping people turn out, buy loads of tickets, spend loads of money in the bar and whatnot. And that kind of can, you know, help them make their money back that way. But obviously that kind of stifles a progression of up and coming DJs because there's not necessarily Necessarily a path you can take you can feel like in your head from like playing in your bedroom all the way until kind of playing in print books or something it doesn't necessarily feel like there's a clear trajectory you can go through it kind of feels like you have to just do what everyone else does and put on your own party and club night launch a label make a really sick tune hope that blows up and then kind of use that to segue into DJing but the actual just to kind of be a quintessential like Ben UFO guy where you just DJ it's very difficult to see a path forward nowadays without a residency thing but I think what this does is that for the customer and the punter it does provide a somewhat level of assurance and safety net that you know what to expect when you're going out so if you went out the first month to see indirectly to see core super you know most likely the other weeks in the month are going to be pretty decent because she's also a bit resident there so you can kind of have an idea on what sort of sound to expect and what sort of dj she might get on as guests who are kind of going to compliment what she puts on i think all those things are really important and i wish more clubs would do that instead of just kind of chopping and changing the flipping program like going from you know i look at it same way like places like corsica studios or other popular places where it can go from one genre to a completely other one just based on the night that it's on and sometimes the contrast can be a little bit too crazy where i feel like if there's a if there's like a flow and a theme towards it that kind of ties it together it kind of makes it a little bit more interesting that way but i'm assuming if you're a smaller club you probably can't afford to do that sort of stuff but i do like how phonics are doing it with their monthly residencies and i feel like it gives punters an opportunity to maybe experience new acts and see people they probably haven't seen it gives them reassurance and comfort to know that they're going to what to expect when they go on a night out and there's you know there's not a feeling of like you're wasting your money or that you're taking a big chance for the artists themselves it gives them a chance to sort of what play in front of a regular audience on a week-to-week -week basis and feel like you're kind of slowly but surely getting to know the crowd know your audience and maybe refine your playing style so you know explore different genres and different approaches to mixing and whatnot all those things are really important going forward so big up phonics for doing this i really do like them and i definitely will probably end up going to one of them going forward but i definitely do like that approach i definitely 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 do and then I think that is it for the Action Zing Show episode number four six. Was it seven or four six eight? One of them anyway. Four six eight or four six seven. Regardless of which one it is. I hope you had a good time. If you enjoyed yourself. If you have, make sure that you smash that like for me and you share this show and you comment down below. If you listen via the audio app, there's links and stuff to me as a person that you can kind of click on and get exposed to. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Of course, listen to the audio podcast you hear the tune of the day. So if you're watching a video, you want to hear the tune of the day, come on the audio and play that thing. If not, I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care and be safe. Peace.